Greetings everybody, Trevor Hall here with Mining Stock Daily and this is our long form episode for this week. We aired a number of interviews from the Beaver Creek Precious Metals Summit throughout the week and there's probably a few more to go early next week before I attend the Global Macro Summit with MI2 Partners uh, again back up in the Rocky Mountains. So happy to be uh, attending that conference next week. So in this episode, we're actually going to take a step away from precious metals and talk about something uh, I know very little about, and that is the coal industry. We welcome in Matt Warder. I asked him, I'd reach out to him on Twitter and I asked him, hey, Matt, come on, give us some information of things we just don't know and we typically don't follow here on Mining Stock Daily. And it was a great conversation, like so much good information about the coal market, where it's been the last couple of years, where it's landed uh, since COVID and the geopolitical risks with Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we also talk about this continued frenzy of buying, uh, China buying iron ore. Uh, a great conversation. It's a little bit of a, a curveball for most of the content here on Mining Stock Daily, but well worth a listen in its entirety. Special thank you to Western Copper and Gold, Arizona Sonoran Copper, and Fireweed Metals for your continued support of the podcast. Uh, we will be back Monday morning with the morning briefing, everybody. I look forward to that. Have yourself a great weekend. Here's my conversation with Matt Warder. Be well. Hey everybody, welcome in to the long form episode this week here on Mining Stock Daily. I'm here with a new guest, but somebody if you are following uh, mining news on uh, the Twitter sphere, uh, you probably are a follower of Matt Warder, and if you're not, you should be. Uh, I asked Matt to come on. Actually, Matt and I have never talked in person until just now. Uh, but I've been following uh, following him for a couple of years now, and I, I'm Matt. I'm really sorry that it took me so long to reach out, but it's good to have you on. It's okay. I mean, you know, most of the mining world, uh, you know, kind of deals more with base metals and precious metals, and there's there's so much more exploration going on for those things, and uh, you know, and industrial materials like you know iron ore and coal, just uh, you know, from a financing perspective and from a, from a news perspective, are just far less. Uh, you know, sexy, to, you know, to talk about it uh, you know, in this world. And I, I, I cover most of those commodities too. So I'm, I'm well aware and, and a pretty avid listener of, uh, of your podcast too. So I'm really happy to be here and talk about uh, some, a little, a few left turn topics. As well. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Cause after a, uh, well, a week at the Beaver Creek precious metal summit, and then another week of airing those interviews that I did at the summit. And I honestly, I'm not even through all of them. There's still more to come early next week like i just kind of need a break from precious metal stories <laughs> and so this is great timing because that's, uh, Matt, that's I, I guess i the, when it comes well when it comes to industrial metals uh there's a lot i just don't know and i think a lot of people who are avid listeners of the podcast we don't know what we don't know and so i was hoping we could have a conversation and really kind of break some ice here because there's a couple different stories storylines within the industrial metals complex mm -hmm. that I think could really keep people's attention. Like I want to kind of dig deep into what's going on with coal, both thermal and met coal in the West, because it had a huge run up during the lockdown COVID times. So I also want to talk about what's going on with iron ore because what well, everything's getting absolutely crushed on recession fears. Iron ore is really hanging in there, which is really kind of surprising to me. And so I guess before we before we dive into this, Matt, like, I think let's have a quick conversation introduction into you, you know, sure. who you are, how you cut your teeth and what you're doing now. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I didn't start off in mining at, at all. My dad was a was a coal, oil and gas attorney. Uh, so he did that stuff. And I was I was headed to medical school. I went to college and played baseball uh, for a couple of years. And I got hurt and I picked up a, uh, picked up a music degree as well. And I applied to medical school and I got out of college and, and then, uh, you know, one thing led to another and I had a, had a band at the time that I, that I just formed and we were writing songs and then, and we started doing well toward, I got into medical school and deferred and, and then, uh, you know, nine years later, like we had, we had this little interesting career of, you know, kind of minor league rock stardom where we got really close to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, we had, had some major label interest and, 
uh, had a lot of really constructive conversations with uh, with these labels and then just never quite got over the hump. Um, and, but to finance all of that, like we had to have jobs, you know, real jobs because right. touring musician, not uh, not exactly high up on the list of, uh, you know, lucrative professions. Um, and so we taught. Um, I taught in the school system. I taught and I taught private uh, music lessons uh, to people from ages, you know, seven up to I think my oldest one was 75. And when when we transitioned out of music, I had one student in particular who was we were studying. Uh, he was studying jazz theory with me. Um, and he. Um, and I was kind of lamenting, like, well, what am I going to do? I got to figure out something else. And he said, well, why don't you come work for uh, for me? And I thought he meant something very unserious. But he showed up the next week with like a full time job offer and a, 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 like the study on central Appalachian coal production. And huh. I didn't know any, I didn't know anything about it. But I, I mean, it was a real job. So I said, yeah, let's let's do that. And so I literally started at the at the very beginning, knowing nothing. Um, I managed his databases because I was, you know, had a background in I could, you know, manage Excel and had, I think we used like DBase 4 or something like completely archaic at the time to like run cost models on all these things. And I learned how uh, to sort of do that and build that up. And a few months later, we were bought by uh, this global consultancy, Wood McKenzie. So in the span of like <laughs> six months, I went from being a professional musician and teacher to uh, a corporate research analyst like that. Wow. So, when when Woodback kind of came on board, like I'm still kind of getting caught up in, you know, on on this topic. And Central Appalachia is a, was a major producer at the time of both thermal and metallurgical coal. In fact, still all of our metallurgical coal production comes from the region, which is where I'm from, from West Virginia. I was based out of Morgantown at the time. And uh, so, what what Woodback brought was they, they bought these, uh, you know, my the coal consultancy I worked for at a, at a sister company in Sydney because they had a gas and power service that you can't solve for gas and power without solving for thermal coal. So that was the value add. Um, a couple of years later, they bought a metals consultancy called Brook Hunt, which covered, you know, base, a little bit of precious, um, those sorts of things. And then all of a sudden, you know, a couple of years later, they said, well, we have, we have a metals consultancy and we have pretty much all the metallurgical coal coverage in the world. Um, we should think about doing iron ore and steel. And then I volunteered to to build that up because I built up like the asset by asset level cost coverage and pulled everything out of, you know, a, like a book that we sold. It was like this thick. I have one over there, as a matter of fact. And then, uh, you know, we turned it into all digital subscriptions. So all the cost models had to be digitized, all that. And, and you know, that's kind of what I did for. Uh, and because I was working on Appalachia, I covered all metallurgical coal. So I had to learn about steel. I had to learn about iron ore. I figured this, this would be a good way to vertically integrate my knowledge. Mm -hmm. So uh, it built up those those assets. And then when you sort of get to the top of that food chain, right, you know, there's med coal, here's iron ore, here's steel. And then you look out over top and it's like, well, all of these things start to come into the cost model. Here's logistics. So you have shipping, uh, shipping data that comes in. Uh, and then you look, start to look downstream into the auto industry and construction industry, and it starts to touch consumer. Uh, you know, a, a third of drilling and completion costs is tube and pipe. So you're cycling back into the, you know, the commodities industry as well. And all of a sudden I go, holy, holy crap, like this is what macroeconomics is. So <laughs> from there, I, uh, you know, I eventually left Wood Mac and went to work for one of the Agora newsletter companies. Uh, they had, mm. they had staked uh, one, of, one of my, uh, you know, longtime friends. Uh, and they wanted us to model coal, oil, and gas together and kind of make a B2B consultancy. Well, turns out they, they weren't great at marketing to, to businesses. They're really good at marketing to retail. Um, but uh, one of the one of the folks that they had uh, that they wanted to do a product with was Rick Rule from Sprott. And they didn't, I was the only mining guy there. So uh, I got paired with them. And Sprott was actually a, um, uh, they were a client of mine. Uh, they had a, they owned a company called or financed a company called Corsa Coal. It's a really small coal producer in central Pennsylvania, and they used all the cost curves that I built at Woodmac to, you know, sort of show where they fit within the market. So, so Rick and I got on pretty well, and I wound up writing a, a newsletter in conjunction with him and talked about his personal holdings for you know the next uh, three years or thereabouts. Mm. And that gave me access not just to um, you know, their, their team who covered base and precious, like I got trained up, you know, reasonably well, I'm still not great, but I'm functional in everything. Uh, but it also gave you access to the C-suites, which I'd never really had before at Woodmac. We mostly dealt with like biz dev units and, and those sorts of things within the banks. 
Um, and so that was that was great for for me. And, and, then, and then of course, when we lost funding, I had to, uh, you know, right around the pandemic, I opened up a solo consultancy, and then I had to start to build out those networks myself. And so, mm-hmm. like, you know, through the course of like that that eight to ten years, you know, I had this really strong industrial metals background. I bolted on base and precious, and, you know, covered uranium and a little bit of these things. And all of a sudden, like, you start to have this, you start to be able to see, uh, you know broadly across the commodity spectrum, how changes in one area affect changes in the other. Um, and I, you know, I've consulted to newsletters and to individual companies. I've done supply demand price forecasts for uh, for a number of them for a bunch of commodities. Um, I write sell side reports that are kind of geared more toward generalists and retail and people who lack subject matter expertise because you know the one power of the newsletter industry is you take really complex, difficult difficult to explain ideas and you have to simplify them like a lot for for consumption by by normal folks so it's you know i now i have the skill sets that's you know broadly communicative across uh, the sectors of macroeconomics uh, but my home like you know what mm. it feels like home base for me like if you talk to me like i'm a coal analyst at heart and that's that's what i come yeah. to and that's the one that i can do in my sleep and and that's i mean that's kind of why we're we're talking here today but i I appreciate like so much, like all the all the various commodities and, and operations that you cover and learn a lot from from listening to your podcast. I mean, every, every week. Well, I appreciate that. Like, you know, and to be honest with you, I I, I dabbled a little bit. Well, I guess I, I never really dabbled with my own capital. But um, when I first started off in this industry here in Denver, there was there was a group called I think it was the, the Denver Coal Club. And. We would meet once a month, typically downtown Denver. There'd be a lunch and a speaker. You know, it was like, but there were in its heyday. It was a very popular place to be amongst the Denver mining group. In fact, like I heard stories just about you know huge parties that this oh, yeah. group would have. Uh, you know, in the '90s, early 2000s. But it, but as like the sentiment towards coal started to wane and decline, you could. You could kind of see that group, kind of the members starting to, uh, you know, not come back. And yeah. and, and even when I was going, you know, I, you know, I was one of the obviously one of the younger people there. But I mean, I, I was able to ask a lot of questions about not only coal, but, you know, mining and and metals in general. And I had a lot of good feedback. And obviously here in Colorado, we still have a couple coal mines uh, you know, and, and coal powered plants still in works. And obviously north of us in Wyoming, the Gillette is just a massive operation. Uh, the, the antelope mine I've actually toured there. And so, you know, it, 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 it did not, um, it was not above me to think that coal was dead. Like I knew coal was still alive and well, but then here comes COVID and, you know, there's, I have zero coal exposure and, never really dabbled to getting exposure in, in coal plays. But then I see, you know, people like you and Koala and other people dabbling into the coal equities. And it had like the best returns in oh, the yeah. entire mining it, industry. It, it crushed Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin yeah. off the peak returns weren't, weren't anything like thermal coal or met, or met coal. It's, it was just really something else. And that's, and that, you know, you mentioned Koala, it kind of plays into his, uh, uh, the whole theme of what happened kind of plays into his eucalyptus paradox idea, right? In, in that you can't you can't recycle your way to growth, right? You still need to have the building blocks, the raw materials that that you that you need in order to make the things that will propel your, you know, whether it's the energy transition or or just general population growth off into the future. And coal kind of got caught up in that, right? Uh, part yeah. of that was was certainly ESG driven, um, but even when I started, you know, back in, you know, the mid 2000s, like the writing was kind of on the wall for U.S. thermal coal generation, if only because it cost, you know, basically $2 billion to build a coal plant uh, of a certain size and half that to build uh, a gas plant of the same size. And with, you know, the fracking revolution happening, like, why, why would you why would you spend the extra, uh, you know, billion dollars when you could, you know, we have this growing gas production, let's take advantage of that. You know, I'd argue much like Charlie Munger that, the, you know, gas has a much more interesting added downstream value if you, you know, convert it to fertilizer, mm-hmm. you know, feed, feed a growing world. But um, 
you know, nobody was really having that conversation at that point in time. And then, and then when, when the Obama administration came in, um, you know, obviously they wanted to, to accelerate that, you know, that transition, pull forward coal plant retirements that were going to happen anyway. They were just going to happen slower. Um, and through the process of doing that engendered all of, you know, just destroyed all the goodwill that the Democrats had, you know, in the southern part of West Virginia and in, in uh, Western Virginia. And, uh, you know, that, that changed the political landscape forever um, in those regions. And the, the knock-on yeah. effects were, were really pretty bad, too, right? Because when you, when you shut down mines, uh, you know, the secondary and tertiary effects are that, well, those are the best jobs in the area. So those are what supports the body shops and the, and the restaurants and the coffee shops. And it, it really had a horrific ripple effect down through the, the economy. And, uh, you know, the, the, the bottom line is that when, when you decide from a, from a top-down level that you're going to physically reduce demand, uh, supply is going to respond because that's, that's how economics works. The problem with coal is that once those mines go away, the political will to bring them back on doesn't exist. So when you have a situation like we had in 2021 and 2022, where gas goes to the moon, coal production was not a available to ramp up to meet that that secondary demand. Interesting. So that's, that's the and that is like in a nutshell the difficult part of the energy transition is like if you go too slow, the planet warms at a at a you know catastrophic rate. Um, but if you go too fast, you break what you do have. And the problem gets worse anyway. So the the whole the the I remember reading the book the the fifth risk, uh, hmm. and uh, by um Alt, who, who's the guy who wrote Moneyball? I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Um. Anyway, but the uh, the, the point the point of the the risk were uh, uh, in the Obama administration they hired a chief risk officer that was ex Apollo management, and I, and uh, the the author asked him like what are your five uh, you know what do, you, what do you think are the five best worst things that could happen? It was like, well, you know, dirty bomb or, you know, terrorist attack. And he went through like four typical sorts of things. And he asked him what the fifth, what the fifth risk was. And he thought for a second, because, you know, you have to think about how to phrase things when they're classified. And he looks at the guy and goes, project management. <laughs> and if you think about politically, how we vacillate from left to right, from left to right, from one set of ideals to another set of ideals, and you do have this goal that, you know, eventually we want, uh, you know, developed markets should stop burning stuff for power mm -hmm. and allow undeveloped markets at least to burn more stuff for power because they need to get healthier and wealthier. And they need power and they need food and they need uh, education and all the things that, you know, that we as people should support them to have. Um, but, you know, if you if you don't lay out how to get from step one to step 30 through steps two, three, four, um, you have a, you have, you're going to have a real problem with achieving anything. Uh, and that's, that's, I think the moral kind of the moral of the story is we, we can, we can probably have a transition, but you have to finance mines and you have to yeah. you know, retire coal plants and those things at, at a pace that's reasonable and replace it with base load, uh, you know, preferably, I think small modular reactors or nuclear until we can get to the point where, okay, well, we have enough lithium nickel, uh, copper for grid scale battery storage or vanadium, if that's if that's the way that we go. And yeah, it's explaining that to a lawyer in D.C. Like, just imagine how difficult it is to take all of those pieces and put them together and try to try to get a reasonable policy craft. It is hard. It's really really tough. So um, so coal is one. Uh, of the, just Michael Lewis. One Michael of the, Lewis. Michael Lewis wrote Michael the Lewis. fifth risk. Yeah, sorry, just to yeah, stay yeah. on my for a second. But um Yeah, yeah. Well in in and so to go back and, and I want to talk about this this the coal market during COVID. I because yeah. it just roared. And yeah. how much of it you know, now that you have some hindsight behind you, how much mm -hmm. of it was fundamental and how much of it was fundamentals turned into mere speculation? Uh so that's a really good question. Uh, all of it was fundamental to some degree because there simply wasn't enough supply to meet, you know, uh, a, an exceptionally large level of demand relative to where we've been uh, in the past or the path that we were on. Mm -hmm. So it was all fundamental driven. But the the interesting thing about it that 
sort of starts to look like speculation is if you think about the cost curve for coal, like the, the, the marginal producer uh, for thermal coal in the United States, you know, it's probably, you know, 100, 110 bucks or something like that. Um, if you all of a sudden require 10 million tons more than the cost curve can supply, well, what is the next marginal ton? Like who, if nobody can increase production, what really is the cost of that last, that last pound? And the answer is infinity. It's whatever anyone is willing to pay for it. So, you, you know, you pay whatever you can to run your operation. You pass through the cost onto the consumer. So it's, uh, you know, the, the speculators were, were riding a wave, right? Uh, you know, and they were mostly riding the, 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 the equities wave that, that went with it. But um, a, along the way, the equities went from having all of this debt to sensibly no debt across the entire industry. So they got healthy as they as as people were speculating on them. And that left them in a position where, well, once you get, you know, once you shed your debt and, you know, there's no nobody will finance a new project. Nobody's going to, you know, really finance a merger unless the seller is going to do it. So what are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to give all this money back to shareholders. There's nothing else to do with it. Accrue yeah. it on your balance sheet or uh, or give it back in the form of buybacks or or, di or dividends. And uh, that made the equities more attractive at these higher price levels that were fueled by, you know, that run up in prices in 2021. So it's, it, but wait, there's more. It's sort of the, you know, the theme to, uh, <laughs> you know, kind of how, how coal equities have, have moved down. I think a lot of the price beta has, we're kind of done with that. We can, there are a few stocks that can probably double or triple from here, but then mm. they turn into the, the biggest, you know, grandpa dividend stocks. Like once the float gets low enough that the world has ever seen, I mean, it's going to be like tobacco bonds take two. It's, it's just, uh, I, I mean, there's, I, I can't think of any other example that, that even holds a candle to it. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember, um, Oh, I can't remember his, his name. He was the head of the society of mine engineering, he was the president for a year. I think he was from, he was, out, I think he was from Kentucky. God, his name escapes me, but I met him a couple of years ago and we we're having a conversation. I said, you know, what, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm involved in the two most sinful industries in capitalism, coal and tobacco. I was like, well, that's one way to do it, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it really is. so it's, funny. You know, the, the evolution of this to me, you know, somebody who's covered the market for you know almost 20 years, has been fascinating. And then when you go talk to guys, you know, on the previous generation of analysts, like, I mean, their eyes get as big as saucers thinking about how just transformative, uh, you know, th this whole process has been. So where are we at now? Where, where's this coal market at now? Because I, I see, I, I don't see as much, you know, kind of boasting about it as we did a year and a half ago. Well, I mean, if I may so say so. It's, it's, the the equity market side is matured, right? So we're we're now mm -hmm. at levels that uh, are at least somewhat representative of of you know the value that they have. We can have we can argue about well how many years of you know multiple should you give you know a company or whatever, but you know for the most part they're performing in line with you know where expectations are per share you know from from month to month and moving along with you know with the price beta of the market. Um, prices for coal itself, whether it's thermal coal or Metallurgical coal had, you know, first we had the run up with gas, uh, which, you know, then we had a run up with metallurgical coal when steel prices went to two thousand dollars, and then that sort of fell off, and then we went into the Russia Ukraine crisis. Russia supplies forty million tons of uh, uh, of thermal coal to to Europe. There's no replacement for that. Nobody can step into the market like the U.S. used to be able to, uh, mm -hmm. and and provide the swing supply. Uh, they provide, you know, like 10, 20 million tons of, of low vol PCI to the steel industry in Europe. There's no, there's no replacement for that either. So, you know, Russia, Ukraine was, you know, the blow off top. Um, but in terms of overall coal consumption, like nothing really changed. It's just supply chains had to readjust. And the, the, uh, the cost of that readjustment was reflected in that blow off top price. When, when they corrected, um, you know, if I looked at the metallurgical coal cost curve, I would venture to guess like the the 90th percentile cost is something like around $200, give or take mm. 10 bucks, something like that. 
Um, and since since we can't finance any new operations, you have to bake in a little bit of profit as well, because if, if you're not if you don't have profit, you're not going to run. So if we think about long term prices for Metco, I think it's more along the lines of like somewhere like 225, 250, depending on where inflation is less. Um, for uh, for thermal coal, um, you know, we can kind of take a look at kind of the marginal supplier into Europe. That's that's probably Consol Energy. Um, and I think their cost to deliver into Europe is about 90 bucks, 95 bucks. Um, so that's kind of the floor of where that market can go. Um, you know, the floor for Met's probably about 175, 180, and it can only touch that for a little while before cost curve really contracts. So absent like, yeah. uh, you know, an unexpected deflation that, you know, encompasses the globe, uh, coal prices relative to where costs are, are sensibly attractive and positive for the foreseeable future. I, I want to kind of separate a couple of ideas, one on thermal coal, the other one on met coal. Sure. But let's first talk with about thermal coal, because I'm, I'm, I want to get a better understanding of the competition for thermal coal energy. Uh, Cause it, you know, eight years ago, there was this massive transition into natural gas energy because it and correct me if i'm wrong but it because it was an easy it was an easy transition to for thermal coal plants to be transitioned to natural gas powered plants is that correct okay yeah, 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 and so this is this is still ongoing obviously but yet there's still this kind of battle against natural gas but it wasn't too long ago where oil producers in the permian basin were literally paying people to take their off product natural gas yeah, yeah, so we well, could, yeah, well, it was naked. crazy. Um, the uh, my my team uh, wrote a uh, wrote a, a promotional investment thesis for uh, for one of the Agora newsletters that was entitled "50 Cent Gas," um, and it was it was the Waha, you know, it was bait and switch between right. gasoline and natural gas. But uh, but yeah, it's <sighs> it's it's that dynamic exactly, right? So so the future of thermal coal prices is is directly tied to the future of gas prices. Uh, my, uh, you know, my success as a natural gas analyst, to paraphrase Rick Rule, is unblemished by success. So I, I'm, I tend to be a consumer of that information rather than a generator of it. Uh, but there's, there's a, you know, there's LNG export uh, uh, a capacity that's coming online in the U.S. in 2024, 25. Uh, that should, and, and then there's uh, Guttar. Uh, Guttar has an expansion, uh, I think, around the same time frame. That should lower. Um, LNG prices on the seaborne market, uh, but at the same time, I think in the U.S. probably also tighten tighten the market domestically because uh, hmm. all that product is being incentivized to move offshore. So where that equilibration sort of comes in is going to determine where both domestic thermal coal prices and, and seaborne thermal coal prices are going to be. Um, like if you if you look, if you just looked at like uh, you know the Japan South Korea LNG price versus Newcastle thermal coal. And then TTF versus uh, uh, mm. thermal coal. They're, they're not identical, but they're 80% correlated or something. Interesting. What about the competition of nuclear energy? Uh, that's all the, obviously that's in a new bear, or excuse me, that's in a new bull market now. I apologize, <laughs> uranium bulls out there listening. Uh, <laughs> that's all we've been hearing for the last couple of weeks is about the spot price of uranium, and we've seen those equities rise. <laughs> Does thermal coal expect to see competition from nuclear energy uh, in the long term? I mean, competition probably isn't the right word because gas won. Like, yeah, gas, oh, okay. you know, blew coal out of the water um, a long time ago. So, so really, I look at you know the nuclear industry as a replacement uh, replacement capacity for coal. Um, so, in my mind, it's less competition and more like. If we don't replace that that baseload coal fire generation, then we have a we have a dispatchable capacity problem in the United States for sure, but also also in Europe. Um, so, like those, I don't I don't really look at it as a competitor. I just look at the at it as as the other side of the coin. Okay, so it's gas versus you know the combination of kind of uranium and coal and and the the right distribution of those three relative to solar and wind. Is really the problem that we're trying to solve. I right. do uh, I do a lot of work uh, with nuclear advocacy groups um, because you know baseload power generators unite um, in that sense. Their their problems are similar in scope 
to Kohl's. It's it's just that you know their theirs is more bureaucratic in origin, uh, and Kohl's is more with the the effect of policy on. Sure. Uh, you know, on on the on the future of the industry. So it's uh, okay. a lot a lot of good folks. Um, I mean, every every time I go to uh, you know an event in DC, like um, everybody's really really smart. What a it's really a fantastic industry filled with a lot of great people. Um, yeah. So n- nothing but love from the coal guys. <laughs> Let me ask you about Met Coal and the future of of metallurgical coal, uh-huh. and 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 this is this is just kind of the story continues to play out in my mind on the back of uh, deglobalization, onshoring, reshoring, uh, you know, trying to reinvigorate manufacturing, not only just the United States, United States, but in the West in general. And I pulled it up this morning because I I had remembered a while ago, I, I, I stumbled upon Apple, their smelter and refiner list. And I mean, it's a big document filled with hundreds of smelters and refiners. Mm-hmm. And without an exact number, I think it's safe to say that 90, probably 90% of every smelter refiner on the list is overseas and probably 60, 70% of those are all in China. Mm-hmm. And so, listen, I, I this 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 cold war that's kind of continuing to fester a little bit between China and the West. It's not going to stop with just iPhones, Apple's iPhones in Chinese government. I do think it will filter into infrastructure and manufacturing. Mm-hmm. So the United States is going to have to find some way to not only invigorate manufacturing, but also invigorate refining and smelting on the back of mining. Mm-hmm. So I that is my bull case for Matt Cole here. Am mm-hmm. I am I wrong to think that Matt, or am I am I kind of getting somewhere? Um, the uh, in the the facilities that we'll build in the U.S. Uh, I mean, most it's mostly rebar that goes into that. That's going to come from recyclers mostly. That's going to come from okay. electric furnaces and those sorts of things. Uh, the 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 blast furnaces that would consume Met Cole domestically. And I'll address seaborne and sort of global trade separate, separate from all this. Um, those are primarily like, you know, white goods, appliances, um, uh, auto demand, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, when If we're going to have an EV transition uh, of any kind, those those vehicles are, are a little more steel intensive than, right. you know, traditional ICE vehicles. So there's there's a bit of an added steel requirement. I mean, the the. In my mind, the reshoring and the manufacturing does more for, uh, you know, the like the, the battery industry. Um, you know, like we we clearly need to build some lithium hydroxide plants on these shores, and there's money in you know the Inflation Reduction Act to go get that and to either put them in America or you know produce it in friendly countries like Canada and rail it down. Like there, there's money to go, uh, government grants to go and 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 do that either from an investment tax credit perspective. Or production tax credit perspective. Um, on the steel side, I think the story is more overseas, uh, and mm. this is what's going to drive Met coal. Um, I think we only consume about maybe twenty million tons of of Met coal domestically, so it's it's not huge. And blast furnaces are going to decline over time, not to zero, but to something manageable. Um, but you know, India, uh, and I have a have the numbers up here, uh, India. Their met coal imports uh, are going to grow from. This was from Bloomberg, I think, uh, and uh, company filings. But in 2022, I think uh, we're expecting them to import about 65, you know, 67 million tons of met coal, and that's going to grow to 81 by 2027. Wow! So it's not not some huge blow off number, but when you realize that China only goes from, you know. Uh, stays flat at 92 like they're not really declining that much um they uh, china has met coal but those reserves are dwindling particularly from a quality perspective so even though they're importing now more from mongolia and, and russia that's not the quality that they need in order to produce uh you know really strong coke so they're going to have to import high, higher quality low volatile coal from australia that's going to keep a bit under prices but it's india that really drives 
the, the consumption going forward. Well, India, India is supposed to see a, a pretty sustainable era of growth here too. I've yeah, so I mean, China's China's moving from growing at eight percent, six percent a year down to two or three. I mean, sort of more like us, really. Right. Um, while while India is ramping up to those those higher levels of growth, and they're they've they've committed to building the you know the infrastructure out for it at a much faster pace. I mean, they're they're building power plants, they're they're building steel plants. Uh, that that expansion is going to happen. Um, it, it, from a pricing perspective, it was really interesting to see this year how the the we had uh, you know a peak like we typically do in February when China comes in to buy net coal, and then and then it declines. Uh, but the bottom was marked by India as soon as quarterly budgets opened up on July 1st, are coming into the market to buy post monsoon season cargoes, mm. like in size, and I think contracts 10x for September uh, over that period of time. And at the same time, China was uh, they had an outage at a mine in in Shaanxi, uh, in you know it's a major coal uh, met coal producing region in August, uh, a couple of fatalities. So they've reduced production pace that so they had to come into the market and buy and when you get the the you know the the twin behemoths of india and china in the market you're going to get a, a move up in in pricing so you know that's kind of how i see you know med coal developing over time the uh the from a supply perspective there's not much more coming on we have you know project mm -hmm. a couple of projects in australia a couple of projects in the united states most of them are not really high quality coal they're 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 not you know premium low volatile coal or uh you know low volatile coal coming out of the east coast they're not in west virginia you know the, the one in alabama is is another high volatile coal so we, we're, we're increasing supply of uh one slightly lesser quality coal and while the the highest quality coals the, the low vols which provide a lot of the strength and stability for coke blends are declining in volume. So if we if we need those, those prices are going to go up, whereas the other ones are going to sort of stay stable. And mm. although I think the next year or two, there's the potential for uh, a bit of oversupply to keep prices subdued. Once you get beyond 2025, th that gap starts to starts to get big and then it widens. And by the time we get out to the end of the decade, uh, I mean uh, we're we're 20 10, 20 million tons short. Wow. So it's, uh, I mean, you can, you can see the writing on the wall. We're going to have to build some new projects. Uh, <laughs> but uh, getting do we have the, Do we have the bandwidth, political bandwidth to do it? I mean, that's a couple of years down the road. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, it I, if it were to how, happen today, no, yeah, absolutely it not. On, it depends on how well advocacy groups perform. You know, advocacy groups for coal are notoriously antagonistic. Um, and you know, this is not a situation where, uh, you know, the, the more that you make the other side mad, the less they're going to want to allow you to do anything. And so, like, I kind of view it as this this is a time where the industry, instead of being, you know, you know, shaking their fist and saying the war on coal, like, this is a time when the American industry especially could say, like, you know, ask not what your country can do for you and ask what you for do, can do for your country. And actually yeah. be there, you know, a, a problem solver from a solutions perspective, uh, and, and and a good citizen, uh, and and come in and, and help. Uh, and yeah. I think that's I think you're going to catch more flies with honey, um, you know, in, in that regard uh, than you will with vinegar. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good metaphor. I that's something I I was just going to say. I know you're from West Virginia, so I, and. Uh, kind of following uh, Joe Manchin's position in the Senate there. Like, I do not envy it. Uh, yeah. He's had to fight a tough battle understanding his state and his constituency. And then, you know, really being an outspoken, uh, middle-of-the-road Democrat in that party right now. It's uh, he's, he's very misunderstood, I think, yeah. right now in regards to the rest of the party, not just – in Washington D.C., but I mean, in throughout the country, like you just they just don't understand 
uh, Joe Manchin's position as no. coming from West Virginia. Uh, that's a topic for another day. I do. I know we only have a couple of minutes left here, Matt, but I, I got to ask you about iron ore because this has been sure. a puzzle that I've kind of brought up in the podcast the last couple of weeks. It continues to do really well despite recessionary fears and this, mm -hmm. you know, continued talk of China's economic demise. Uh, I just pulled up, I, I just did an iron ore news cap capture from Google this morning. Uh, BHP delivers 3 billion tons of iron ore to China. That was reported yesterday by by, uh, by BHP, um, they, they continue to import iron ore. So what is it? Do we have a, a flailing Chinese economy or do we have them really working on uh, continued boosting their infrastructure? Uh, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think we're going to see, you know, uh, you know, another real estate boom or anything like that. Um, I do think they'll try to do some consumer focused things, but Really, I mean, the, the thing to focus on, I think, for 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 iron is the is their electric vehicle transition. You know, they they've chosen uh, you know to use lithium iron phosphate batteries. Kind of that's that's the bulk of uh, of production that they have. And, and China has a lot of uh, a lot of iron ore. They have a lot of iron ore mines. We costed a bunch of them. Uh, you know, when we built the the service of Woodmac, they're you know it's not great quality. There are a lot of impurities. A lot of them, uh, you know, back then were underground, so the costs were enormous. Um, but you know, for for a lithium uh, for lithium iron phosphate battery, I think you probably live with some of those. Uh, if you're China, you can live with some of those. You know, maybe less than less than stellar qualities. Uh, but you know, you still have to import your quality iron units from you know from Brazil and Australia. Um, that's just mm -hmm. that's how it is. So um, if they're going to continue to produce steel at that clip, uh, then they're going to need quality iron units. Uh, to to maximize their productivity and keep their costs down because cooking coal prices really aren't necessarily going to go anywhere. So it's you know it's it's very I think it's it's very good for you know companies like you know Vale and BHP and maybe not so great for you know the Fortescues of the world that, that produce lower quality ore. Um, yeah. And interestingly, you mentioned mentioned the mansions. I mean they they've been they're close personal family friends. Uh, I grew up maybe half a mile from their house, so understand mm. it's pretty interestingly. Like, uh, but he's a, he's he's quite fond of Twiggy, uh, <laughs> as, a, as a matter of fact. Uh, be, uh, only because uh, you know, Mr. Forrest is seeking as many possible solutions uh, as as he can, and you know, and Senator Manchin kind of believes that 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 sort of like all of the above approach is kind of what we have to do in in the interim in order to solve the the step twos, the step three, so that we can get to the step 30, like I mentioned before. And, right. you know, in in that sense, like he's kind of the only guy on the Hill that gets it in that guard. He, he knows energy. Um, he really does. Yeah. Um, but, you know, having these conversations with, with, you know, other, other colleagues on the Hill are more difficult. Just there, nobody can be an expert on everything. That's why we have a bureaucratic class, and all, that, all this sort of thing. But like, you know, I don't think anybody like, on the hill is looking at you know the EV transition Ooh. in China as being as being one that is coal centric to reduce their dependence on foreign oil. I think that's something that like th they're sort of whiffing on, right? Like they're they're, right. they're building out all this coal fired generation, and they're building out all these electric vehicles, uh, you know, powered by iron batteries, much uh, cheaply. That's cheaper, yeah, cheaper vehicles too. That are they're more steel intensive. You know, they're importing quality iron ore from. From all these other places, they're they're shutting down the small coke ovens that stamp charge and opening up larger ones that require more quality coal. China's getting more expensive. Period. Stop. And like that that particular transition is going to be expensive for them, but uh, it will reduce their dependence on foreign oil if they if they can do it. They have all the battery components they need. Uh, you know, they have a command economy, so they can force people to take the transition, and they have enough coal fired power uh, to actually make the things run. So, yeah. so for them, it's a, it's it's a, it's it's a bit of a power play, right? Um, and that's a, I, th I think, you know, maybe maybe just kind of getting missed by the, by the political class. But there's um, there are so many of these types of stories that are happening in the world simultaneously, yeah. and it's it, it seems like only the mining guys are the ones keeping track of it. <laughs> Oh, shocker. Why shocker. All right. Why is that? Uh, Matt, I knew this was going to be a great conversation. It's so refreshing. 
uh, to dive into something I just knew very little about. And I uh, thank you so much for your work and your expertise and for your time. So uh, uh, before we let you go, uh, people can follow you on Twitter, but is there another way? Uh, is there another way to get a hold of you? Uh, that's it right now. Uh, at M F Warder uh, on Twitter. Um, I, I did. I was going to start a, a Substack at some point in time, but uh, there are potentially other things afoot. Uh, okay. So we, we put that on hold for a bit. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what this what this year holds. It's going to be an interesting okay. one uh, for sure. But absolutely. Uh, follow me on Twitter, reach out. Um, I love to talk about all these subjects uh, and, you know, learn from people who know more than me about, you know, all those other metals that, that I yeah, yeah. scratch the surface on. All right, Matt. Thanks so much. Have yourself a great weekend. You too. Thanks a lot. 